Amen. Well, you guys can be seated. Hey, Merry Christmas. How are we doing? <laughs> awesome. Uh, so this is fun because I, I love this. And uh, if I haven't met you before, by the way, my name is Matt. I get to be the new lead pastor here, and I'm super excited, but I love participation, okay? So I know that it's early, and everybody stayed up late getting ready for you know Christmas and wrapping presents, but I'm going to ask for a little better response. So you guys in? Okay. All right. How are we doing? Awesome. Awesome. I love it. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today, and I hope that you are excited as well. And by the way, uh, today uh, is a special day. We have a five o'clock service. It's a special service. Uh, we're going to have a candlelight, and also this is a two-part uh, message today. So if you catch the first part, it's going to be like you just won't be able to, to go home and not think about What's going to happen tonight? So be sure and be here tonight. Think about who you can invite. Uh, like I said, my name is Matt, and we have some awesome stuff coming up in this coming year. And so, man, we would love for you to be a part of New Vintage. We'd love for you to jump in uh, and, and be a part of what we're doing here. Uh, as Scotty said, we're going to kick off Financial Peace University. I I'm here to tell you, it changed my wife and I's life. It changed the way we uh, dealt with finances, and instead of our finances controlling us, we're, we've been able to control them, and we've been able to be generous, and we've been able to do things that we never thought we'd do. So if that sounds like something that you would be interested in, or you know somebody that would be interested in that, we'd love for you to jump in. Well, we just finished a series uh, talking about the I Am Statements of Jesus, and we went through this seven-week series, and what we talked about is that many times Jesus was misinterpreted or misunderstood, right? And we see that throughout history, that there's things that people do in the name of Jesus, and, and when we read our Bibles, we're like, man, I don't know if I've ever seen that in the Bible. And so we started looking at what does Jesus say about himself, and, and as we head into the Christmas season, I'm going to tell you there were a lot of things uh, that were unexpected, that were misunderstood, and people were kind of going, is this what this is about? Now, for many of us, uh, we kind of enter into the holidays, and we have a lot of different things on our mind, right? Uh, when it comes to the holidays, I, I don't know about you, but I think about a lot of different things. For some of us, we're excited about being together with family. We're like, man, I can't wait for our family. Everybody's coming in town, and I can't wait to all get together. For some people, uh, you're excited, man, just to eat together, right? You get these special foods that you don't get any other time of the year, and you're like, man, I can't wait. I, I grew up in Texas, and so we have uh, some foods that I was always just like, man, I never get this after moving to Oregon and now living in California. It's like, I never get this. And when I go home to Texas, I, I can't wait for it. Maybe it's sing together, singing together and just like singing Silent Night or singing some of these different songs that we sing during Christmas time. And it's just like, it's just special to you, especially uh, if you have amazing voices. Maybe it's sharing in the spirit of Christmas, getting and giving gifts. Maybe it's eating together. Did I mention that one already? Yeah, yeah it's good. It's good. For others of us, Christmas is a time that comes with mixed emotions. Maybe it's our first or our 31st Christmas without the loved one that we're used to sitting at the table with us. Maybe things took a hard turn this year and you, you know that Christmas is going to look different. And you're not going to be able to celebrate like you normally do. Maybe your family's at odds this year, and, and you're wondering what Christmas dinner is going to look like if it even happens at all. Maybe your addiction has pushed you away from your family, or maybe you know someone, you're related to someone whose addiction has taken over their life, and you're just wondering, are they going to show up this Christmas? Things that happen all the time that are unexpected. And when Jesus, the Messiah, made his entrance into the world, it was definitely unexpected. It definitely didn't look like people thought it was going to look like. And one of the things that I love about our relationship with God, even though uh, at times that it's unexpected, God's way is always better than we could imagine. And I want you to remember that because there's going to be times in your life, it says, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, 
for I have overcome the world. And so we trust in God's way, even when it's hard, even when it doesn't look like we think it's going to look. And that's how it works with the birth of the Messiah. It's certainly how it started off for Mary and Elizabeth. Now, Mary and Elizabeth were related, and Elizabeth was expecting, but that was totally unexpected, right? And if you know this story, you know that Mary and Zechariah, in their own words, were old. They're like, we're old. There's no way that we're going to have a kid. And they're saying, yes, you will have John. He will be known as John the Baptist, and he will proclaim the way of the Messiah. And Mary has an unexpected encounter as well, and some of you know this story. Some of you, that's going to be your first time, but an angel shows up to Mary and shares some news that didn't just surprise Mary. It surprised Joseph. It surprised everyone. Uh, it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. It says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now, I was sharing this earlier, but one of the, the things that benefits in some ways that we have is we know how the story ends. But Mary, when she's hearing these words and an angel appears to her, she is like, what is going on? You ever had somebody that comes up to you and starts saying nice, syrupy, sweet things to you, and you're like, what's the catch? Right? You feel like you're being buttered up. You're like, okay, what's coming after this? What are you going to say? What are you going to ask me to do? What's going to be required of me? Mary right here is saying, listen, she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered, what's going to happen next? What kind of greeting is this? What's the ankle? Where are you going? And why am I highly favored? It continues, it says, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Do not be afraid has never been a more appropriate phrase than at this moment. Because Mary has to be saying, this was totally unexpected. And I don't know how this is going to play out. Can you imagine how shocked she must have been? Not only is she going to have a child, but it will be God's son. He will become ruler and reign forever uh, without end. And she has questions, the first one being a big one. We see it in Luke 1.34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? How will this happen? Mary's saying, I'm not sure if you know how this works, but I don't understand. I'm a virgin, and I don't know how this is going to happen. Mary has held to the Jewish law and has not had any relations with any other person. So son, ruling over nations, but she trusts God, and she submits to his will, saying this in Luke 1.38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And I think there's some really important things within these scriptures because can you imagine as the angel left her how surprised and shocked she must be feeling? But notice what she does. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled in me. Even though it's unexpected, even though I don't know how it's going to turn out, even though I might be scared, I will serve the Lord. And somebody else that comes as a surprise to is Joseph, right? It's a surprise to Joseph. He is troubled, and he has to make a hard decision because suddenly uh, his fiance is with child. And, and she, she's going like, listen, an angel came to me, and he's going, yeah, I'm not sure if I believe that. It says, but 
Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, something to note back then is uh, marriage and being engaged, it looked a little bit different. As soon as you entered into a marriage agreement, in other words, this man and this woman are to be married, you were considered married. Even though you were just engaged, you hadn't had any relations yet. And so this is why Joseph is navigating this conundrum. He's saying, listen, I don't know what to do. She's with child, but yet, even though I love the law, I don't want to expose her to public disgrace. I want to be gentle with her. It says, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, Son of David. I want to pause right there for a second. Um, The angel is pointing to who Joseph is. A son of David. In the line of the foretold Messiah. And the angel is calling him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Joseph awakes and decides to stay with Mary, and he takes her home as his wife, but has no relations with her. Can you imagine? And I don't know if we fully can grasp it, but can you imagine what they must have been feeling? Can you imagine what they must have been thinking? What are our families going to say? How are we going to explain this? How are we going to navigate this? And what is this? The Son of God. To to me? I'm, I'm just Mary. I'm just Joseph. How are we going to raise the Son of God? Well, this is not how I'm sure they expected the first year of their relationship to go. Young pregnant, and then, by the way, to continue on with a line of unexpected, an unexpected trip. Luke 2 verse 1 says, at that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman empire. A couple important things to note here. One, this is a historical event. This is a historical event. The emperor, the emperor decreed it, and so they did it. Everybody was to return to their uh, designated town and have a census. In other words, to be counted, to, to be understood. And this uh, is difficult in and of itself because this trip was about 80 to 90 miles. And Mary, remember, is not only pregnant, but she's close to full term. It says in Luke 2, 3 through 4, all returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem. Now this over and over, everything that happens is fulfilling scripture. Everything that happens is fulfilling Old Testament prophecies about the Savior, the Messiah that is to come. And one of these is that the child will be born in Bethlehem. And so they begin to make this trip. This, like I said, was not a short walk. It was 80 to 90 miles. And listen, they didn't have a car to jump in and zip down the 15. This was a long, a hard trip. And Mary is almost at full term. And as I was reading about this journey, uh, it had like lots of terrain changes. It was rocky. And so it would have been difficult. And Mary like probably can't even see her feet at this point. This is where we write in this idea of a donkey. But if we look at scripture, we don't actually see a donkey ever being there. And so there could have been. Mary could have taken the journey on a donkey, but most likely, very high probability is that she walked quite a bit of this journey. I went to go see one of my friends. Uh, He lives about four blocks away. I drove, (laughs) right? 
I, I don't know about you, but most of us in today's day and age, we're used to driving. Uh, we have a son that goes to school in the Netherlands, and they ride their bikes, and they walk everywhere. The first time we ever went to the Netherlands, we got off the plane. We took a train for about 40 minutes to Rotterdam. We get off the train, and my wife says, let's go. If you ever need to get something up accomplished, talk to my wife. She'll get it done. But she cracks the whip. She's like, we, let's go because we have to find a place for our son to live. And, and we walked seven miles in the rain, and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> the next day, we walked 10. The day after that, we walked 12. Like, we walked so many miles that day, and my legs felt things they hadn't felt in a long time because we are not used to walking that much. But Mary and Joseph make this trek, saying, God, what are you up to? God, what's going on? It wasn't the end of the unexpected. They arrive in Bethlehem, and they found that they had no place to stay. They had not only no place to stay, but they had no place to birth the Savior the world and you have to imagine tired from travel feeling out of sorts in a nearby stable that that Mary and Joseph must have been saying God is this how the Savior comes into the world is this the promise that you told about are we doing it right are we going to mess it up no grand celebration, no coming up in power, away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The Savior of the world, born into humble circumstances, to a poor family, to immediate suspicion and concern by the Roman government. And although it was unexpected, what God was really up to was even more unexpected. What God was about and the the mission that God set in place that day and Jesus willingly coming to earth and living as fully God but fully man was unexpected. How it would end was unexpected. His entire life, a lowly life, living a life of service instead of being served. It's something that always amazes me when it comes to our relationship with God, when it comes to Jesus on earth. Like Jesus could literally say, I'm the son of God, serve me. I'm the son of God, be sure that you make straight the path. Make sure that there's palm branches waving everywhere I go. I want the finest delicacies. I want the greatest service, and yet he came to serve, not to be served. Unexpected. The Messiah, salvation, good news to all that came in a form of a baby born in a manger. Luke 2, 10 through 11 says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So, come back tonight as we hear the rest of the story and we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. Hey, welcome and Merry Christmas! If I haven't met you before, uh, my name is Matt and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here. And this is my first Christmas at New Vintage. Yeah. And I'm so just excited. I'm excited about 
who God is and what God is doing. Uh, DJ talked, and for some of you that this is your first time uh, here since this started, the church that my wife and I came from said, hey, we want to bless you guys as you come down to Escondido. And they said, so we're going to match our Christmas offering dollar for dollar up to $50,000. And here's what I'm going to tell you. We're so, so close. And so I want to thank you guys for giving, for giving generously. And here's the thing. When we give, it's not just, you know, so that we can, you know, stuff our pockets with Christmas bonuses. It's so that we can serve in our community, so that we can be the light of the world here in Escondido and the surrounding area. So I want to thank you. And I'm going to ask you guys to do something maybe a little bit new. Can you just guys put your hands together for what God's already done? Yeah. We're just really excited about this and all that God's doing. I want to start tonight uh, by reading some scripture. It's found in Luke 2, uh, starting in verse 11. It says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God. In the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor favor rests. If you decorated for Christmas this year, there's a good chance that maybe you had a manger. That there's a manger somewhere, whether it's in front of your home, it's inside your house, it's on a card that you sent out. We understand this idea of a manger. It's a part of the nativity scene. Now, over the years, I've seen a lot of different nativity scenes. I've seen a living nativity scene. You guys seen those before, right, where people are actually acting out the nativity? I've seen a canine nativity scene. Anybody ever seen that one? It it seems to be a favorite. Uh, I've seen a hipster nativity scene. Yes, it's fantastic. Uh, And there's a nativity scene that I never want to see again. This one right here. Yes. Yes. I I love people. I love being together with people. And I'm thankful for technology. But let me tell you, I love when I can get together with my people and celebrate. The, The first manger scene is the most unlikely and the most unexpected places for God to enter the world. Now, I'm not talking uh, about where the, the baby Jesus was born, but I'm talking about in a manger. I'm talking about in lowly circumstances because as we talked about this morning, there's so many things that were unexpected, but here's what we know and what we trust. That even though it might be unexpected, that the ways of God, even though unexpected, are always better than we could imagine. So, the Savior, born to rescue all of humanity, comes in in Luke 2, verse 7 like this. It says, She, Mary, gave birth to a son. She wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging for them. A manger is for a place for animals to eat. A manger is a place that would have been filthy, that would not have been sanitary, that would not have been ideal for the birth of a baby, much less the Messiah. It was not a place for guests, not family, not, like I said, sanitized. Shepherds would have been around there, people of the lowest ranking, always working with animals, and by the way, they probably smelled like them too. This isn't what they expected. Maybe you can identify. Maybe the last couple years were not what you have expected. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you lost a loved one. You went through a breakup or or a divorce and you're going, God, this is not what I expected this year. Maybe you're not talking with family or relationships are strained. And you're praying, God, please help this Christmas be better than I expect. Uh, There's times where life just kind of falls apart, aren't there? Uh, My dad uh, has a wife uh, that he married a couple years ago, and uh, they were hanging out last night, and my sister had asked about uh, some stockings, and so she went to go grab the stockings up from the attic because they were in storage, and suddenly my dad and my sister heard a loud bang. 
and they ran out to the garage to find that she had fallen down the steps of the attic and banged her head on the concrete. Nine staples in her head later, it wasn't what was expected. But here's what I'll tell you. It's times like that that bring what is most important to mind, that we pray for one another, that we lean into family, that we lean into caring for one another. There's one of my favorite songs that we sang earlier, O Holy Night. And there's a line that speaks to what I think all of us find that we want. A thrill of hope. A weary world rejoices. Don't you love that line? The thrill of hope. I remember as a kid uh, having that thrill of hope of something I was looking forward to. I remember when I first came to to understand what a relationship with Jesus looked like, and I said, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. There was a thrill of hope. And my weary soul rejoiced. And here at the birth of our Savior, a weary world rejoices that a Savior has been born, even though in the most unexpected of places. And so many are weary, aren't they? Anxiety, depression, panic attacks, suicide. It's off the charts. There's sirens outside our doors right now. We talked about this morning how Mary and Joseph were most likely weary from travel, that this journey would have been 80 to 90 miles, and they most likely had walked most of it. Mary was almost full-term pregnancy, and that would have been difficult, give birth, giving birth to a Savior in unexpected circumstances. Heck, a virgin birth, remember? Joseph was going to divorce Mary quietly, but an angel appeared to him and said, hey, this is of God, stay with her. And maybe that's why you came today. Maybe you're looking for a thrill of hope. Maybe your life has fallen apart and you're like, I'm at the end of my wits. Maybe Jesus has something for me. And it can be so easily robbed from us if we don't pay attention, can it? That thrill of hope, the joy that comes in knowing God. I'm sure that Mary and Joseph struggled with it at times. I know that we can struggle with it. You ever been there? God, I prayed and you didn't answer my prayer. We phrase it more like, I prayed for this, but you didn't answer the way I wanted, right? Or God, I thought you were supposed to fix it all. God, I thought after I gave my life to you that life was supposed to be easy and it's been difficult. Many of us have tried and it didn't work that way. That's why you bailed or maybe you never fully jumped in. You thought that God was relevant to your life, but you lost the thrill of hope. This is why the birth of our Savior makes Christmas so incredibly special and something worth celebrating. The the first Christmas story tells us where our hope is. This is Matthew's account of the Messiah in in Matthew 1, starting in verse 18. It says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David. And and I I just pause here for a moment. There's so many things going on in this little bit of scripture uh, about a woman that was a a virgin yet found herself with child, about Joseph wrestling and Joseph, a son of David, in the line of King David. David in the line of so many people before, some who lived a life close to God and some who lived a life very far from God. And it says, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit and she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, The virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
See, the child gets two names. And I want to talk just briefly about those two names tonight. Uh, there, there were names that were given that were more about what God would do through his son. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, and now this one, 900 years before Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. This name is huge for us. No longer is God out there. No longer is God far away. No longer do I have to go to the high priest who goes into the Holy of Holies and we have a rope tied around his waist just in case he hasn't cleansed himself enough. No, Emmanuel, God with us. And I don't want you to lose in this season the thrill of hope of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. This life is to be with God in relationship with him. He walked our earth, breathed our air, and felt our pain. Unexpected, isn't it? Look what one writer says about Jesus. Uh, it's in Hebrews chapter 4. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Emmanuel, God with us. So here's what that means. You ever lost a parent? Jesus, earthly father, Joseph died when he was young. He says, I know what it's like. I remember Ever been lonely with temptation? Jesus says, I was tempted by Satan himself, I remember. Ever lost a loved one? Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus, his friend that we just talked about a couple weeks ago. And he says, I know your pain, I remember. Ever spent the night dreading the next day? Jesus says, I was in the garden of Gethsemane, praying so hard that my sweat was like blood, I remember. Ever had someone break your heart? Jesus had people deny and betray him. I remember. Ever faced the reality of your mortality? Jesus would have lived with this daily when he would walk by and see people on the hill of the skull, Golgotha. And he says, I remember. The manger reminds us that God is with us, that God is with you. And there's another name that he gets, not just Emmanuel, God with us, but also Jesus, the one who saves. It, it says he will save his people from their sins, our sins, the things that we say and that we do that hurts us and that hurts others, regrets, the things that keep us up at night, the things that make us a little less like Jesus each time. We've all thought, I'll never do that again, drink that again, smoke that again, say that again, watch that again, and then you do. But there's good news, and that good news is, this is the way Galatians says, says it, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that is hung on a tree. Romans chapter 6 says it this way, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we have Emmanuel, God with us, and Jesus, Savior of our souls. We must remember that God's plan from the beginning, from the manger to the cross to the empty tomb is to make a way, a bridge for us to the Father. That he was born between two peasants, died between two thieves, and then three days later rose again. He is with us and now saves us. This is good news for everyone. Guys, I want to tell you, this is good news for everyone. This is for gang members and school teachers. It's for those who are hung over and for those who are counting their days trying to stay clean and sober. Those with single moms, those with no moms, those with two moms, those with stepmoms. It's for refugees and immigrants. It's for first responders, frontline workers, for farmers, truck drivers, stockbrokers, meth dealers, rednecks, politicians, factory workers, and foster kids. It's for everyone. 
It's for SDSU fans and USC fans. It's for Dodgers fans and Padres fans. It's for everyone. It's for those whose families are falling apart and those who look like they're Instagram perfect. It's for those single people who desperately wish they would get married. And it's for married people who desperately wish they were single. For young and old and everybody in between, if you are collecting unemployment or a trust fund, this is for you. If you go to work in a business suit or work in yoga pants, if you don't go to work at all, this is for you. This is good news. I don't care if you're an atheist or an agnostic. This is good news of great joy for all people that a Savior was born. And that a Savior was born to be Emmanuel God with us. I saw a video a while back and I I thought about how this relates to some of us. It was about a kid who was out shopping. He, he was with what you know, probably was his mother, and he began looking around, and suddenly they became detached, and, and the kid wandered this way, and the mom began to wander the other way. And the kid didn't realize he was lost for a little bit. You ever been there? You ever remember a time like that, or maybe that happened to you with your child, and the kid begins to wander, and suddenly you see from some of the camera angles in the store that the kid suddenly realizes that they are lost, and they begin frantically looking around for their mom. Can you imagine? Have you been there? The kid is uh, frantic, looking around, trying to find mom, trying to find mom. And suddenly, the child sees the mom from across the store and just runs to the mother and hugs them. Guys, here is what I'm telling you today. Sometimes it takes some time before we know that we're lost. But when we do, We need someone to rescue us from the mess that we have gotten ourselves into. And doesn't it feel good? When we find the protection in the home that we're looking for, we feel safe again. We feel comforted. This is what God did. He came to save us, and he is now with us. Jesus intercedes on behalf of us. He came to rescue what was lost. And that is why we celebrate Christmas. In fact, I want you to catch this tonight. Christmas is Christ with us. And this is good news. This is good news for all people. So I have a question. What are you going to do with that news? What are you going to do with that good news? Jesus said more than believe in me. He said, follow me. Every interaction that Jesus has with someone, he offers that person grace. And he also says, go and leave your life of sin and follow me for there is a better way. You may come every Christmas and you may say, I believe, Matt but do you follow? Does it affect the way that you live your life day to day after you walk out of this building? Do you follow and explore and implement the teachings of Jesus in your life? And here's what I found and what hundreds and thousands of people throughout time have found. That following Jesus makes your life better. And it makes you better at life. It's it's crazy that the things said in the Bible actually make sense. That they actually bring you to life. And as the Bible says, abundant life. But you have to do more than just believe. You have to follow. This is a gift. Anyone that has followed Christ knows this gift. That there's this, there's this great line in Oh Holy Night that we just sang just a minute ago. And I just desperately within me wanted to do it. It says, fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angels chorus. And I just think about that night as the Savior was born into the world, people on their knees, hearing the angels celebrating Emmanuel, God with us, God who made a way, who sent his son that we might have life. It's for you. 
I don't want you to just believe it. I want you to follow it. I want it to transform you. I want to, you, you to know the life that is abundant, that is found in Christ. So maybe today's the day that it's time to bow before him. Maybe it's physically, maybe it's mentally, but it is saying, God, I yield to you. I thank you that you so love the world, John 3, 16 that you gave your one and only son, that whoever might believe in you would not perish but have eternal life. For God, you were on a rescue mission for everyone because you didn't send your son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through Jesus. So it's an invitation. Yes, I want you to know Christ. Yes, I want you to believe in Christ, but I want you to follow Christ. I want you to know the life that is found in him. And I want it to overflow to everyone that you are around. I want you to know that thrill of hope this Christmas season. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you that a Savior is born. And that you gave your life that we might experience true and abundant life. And Father God, I pray today that maybe some of us have been people who have considered believing. I pray that maybe they would believe and that we would take that step from belief to following you. God, for some of us, we believe for a long time, but we've never said, hey, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to throw every chip in and I'm going to go for it. I'm going to follow you. And for some of us, God, we've been following and we feel a little bit weary. God, I pray that we would know tonight the thrill of hope. And I pray tomorrow as we rise and go about our day of unwrapping presents and spending time with family and making those hard phone calls and doing those things, God, that we do on Christmas, that we remember that it all started in an unexpected way in Bethlehem. A baby born to a virgin. Jesus, the hope of the world. Emmanuel, God with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.